This is the Alps Mountaineering Lynx 2-person tent and I'll be testing it for its ease of use, space, features, quality, and loads more. I bought this tent from Amazon, here's what the outer cardboard packaging looks like, and well, it's made in China. That's not a deal breaker for me, but I'm not sure if it is for you guys. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it in the comments below. But for now, here's me unboxing it. Here's what the Lynx looks like, brand new from Amazon. I got the tent along with some product info by the side here, which I'll show you more of later in the quality test. Now, let me take everything else out of this brown carry bag and see what else I get. Along with the carry bag, I also got the tent body, the rainfly, a gear loft, 10 stakes and 4 guidelines in a separate carry bag, as well as 2 poles and another carry bag, which look like this when you take them out. Oh, and I also got some repair patches, which are always nice to have. As for the ease of setup, it's really not too difficult, and first, here's a full time lapse of me setting up the entire two person links on my own, and it usually takes me just 6.5 minutes to do so. Take note that this isn't the setup video, this is the review video, so if you need like better instructions and tips on how to set this up, you can check out this other video on my channel. Moving along, I'll give you the gist of the setup process as well as some pros and cons that I can think of along the way. So basically, the two orange poles that I showed you during the unboxing, these each go diagonally across the tent like this. And to secure these two poles, there are these grommets in the four corners of the tent. And this is the first pro. I really like that there are two grommets in each corner, one outer grommet and one inner grommet, so you can adjust the poles depending on whether the tent fabric is too taut or too loose, which is nice. After that, you gotta clip the pole clips onto the poles. Here's a couple more pros. I like that the pole clips have this orange webbing, so it's really easy to locate them. Clipping them onto the poles is also very intuitive. I don't think you can really get this wrong. And also, I really love that I don't have to deal with any annoying snaggy pole sleeves here. Altogether, there are 16 of these smaller pole clips and one huge last pole clip right at the top. After that, the rainfly goes over the tent body with the vestibule zips over the doors at the back and the front of the tent, plus orange color coding at the widths of the tent. And the first con that I found, before securing the rainfly, you gotta lift it up and look for these velcro strips on the underneath of the rainfly. There are four of these to be attached to the orange poles. And I found these to be really big, pretty loose, and for mine at least, there's no way to make it a little bit more snug over the poles. Then to secure the rainfly, I love these super quick buckles. There are four of these at the four corners of the tent. After that, just stake down and guy out the entire tent. And here's where I found another con. I had to use two of my own stakes and two of my own guy lines so that I could guy out the width of this tent. And I would definitely recommend guying them out for more ventilation and less condensation. Moving on to the ease of pack away, I also went through that in my separate setup video, so I'm not going to go through that in detail here, but what you need to know is that it usually takes me about 7 minutes and a bit to take down this entire tent and pack it away back into the carry bag. One minor con I found here is that the carry bag can be a bit bigger, or Alps Mountaineering could have provided compression straps instead, because right now it takes a little bit of struggling to get everything back in. But I guess the pro here is that this carry bag packs down everything nice and tight. The peak height inside this two-person length is about 47 inches, which is almost a full 4 feet. For a two-person tent, I think it's actually very tall. I basically only need to crouch and bend over to get in and out of the tent, and it's almost as tall as I am. Well, sort of. Here's me just leaning over the tent a little bit, and basically I'm not that much taller than the tent. Okay, now let's get into the tent and check out what it looks like. In this shot, there's no mattress at all, and I was able to sit up at the peak height with so much headroom left over. And even though the peak height is only at the center, the other sides of the tent without the peak height didn't even feel too squishy. Here's what a 4 inch thick pad looks like inside the tent. There's still so much headroom left over and I can even stretch my arm all the way upwards. What about a 6 inch thick mattress? Well, here's what it looks like as well and surprisingly still lots of headroom left which is always very nice to have. In fact, when I was deflating both my pads, I could crouch inside no problem at all to deflate them and I found it to be very user friendly. Now moving on to the base area, here are my own personal dimensions. 
the length inside this two-person links comes in at about 89 inches, while the width comes in at about 59 inches. I think the length of this tent is a really nice size, taking about 20% or 18 inches off as some buffer. I'm pretty sure this could fit anyone that's up to like 6 feet. If you're taller than 6 feet, you can sleep a little more diagonally across the tent and that'll be fine too. As for the width, unfortunately, it's a little bit too short to be able to fit a true queen bed, which comes in at about 80 by 60 inches. However, I found that my two-person links could fit a slightly smaller than queen-sized mattress like this Alps Mountaineering Vertex Airbed that I have here, and this measures about 80 by 56 inches, so it fit perfectly into the tent. If you're planning to fit just two regular sleeping pads inside, like this Expat Mega Med Duo 10, then there'll be no problem at all. You'll get plenty of leftover space, not just at the width of the tent, but also at the length of the tent. Now, the inner tent isn't the only space that you'll get. On top of that, you'll also get some vestibule area, and let's go through that next. With the ring fly in place over the tent, I highly recommend zipping the vestibule up before staking it down, because this makes it much easier to unzip or zip up the vestibule when you're done. If you do this, the zipping experience is actually pretty good with no snags at all, whether zipping or unzipping, and these are all real-time clips that you see on the screen here. This two-person links comes with two very nice vestibule areas, which are exactly the same on both sides, and the longest width of each vestibule is about 31 inches. There was more than enough space to fit my flip-flops, my tripod, still with plenty of leftover room in the vestibule, and this is one of the bigger vestibule areas I've seen in a two-person tent. The vestibule also comes with two different loops at the bottom, so you can stick down either loop, either the left or the right, whichever you prefer, and this allows you to open either side of the vestibule, like so. Or if it's not raining and if you want easier access into your tent, you can unstake the vestibule completely and tie it up with these two toggles right here. Once you tie the vestibule up, this will give you access to the two doors of this two-person links. Both doors are exactly the same, and there's one door at each length of the tent, like so. I do wish that I could unzip the vestibule a little bit more at the top, so I can more easily access the door zipper behind it. But overall, not a big issue, I found the zipping experience to still be pretty good. Also with no snags, and here are more real-time clips that you can check out. And there are two zippers on each door. When the door is closed, about half of it is covered in mesh. It feels soft and silky, it's definitely micro mesh and not regular mosquito netting, although I did wish that there will be more mesh for more ventilation. So I tend to like to leave the door open for more ventilation, and I could tie the door fabric up with these two toggles at this side of the door. When the doors are open, each of them have a longest length of about 41 inches and a longest width coming in at about 39 inches, so I think they're really quite big. That plus the peak height of this tent makes it pretty easy to get in and out of the tent through either of the doors, especially because I'm not very tall. There are two pockets in this two-person length, one at each width of the tent. Do take note of the position of these pockets because that's something that is super important to know in the rain test later. But for now, each pocket isn't too big coming in at just 9 by 7 inches, so it can't fit like a lot of stuff. As for lantern loops, there's one right at the very top of the tent for some lighting at night, which is nice to have. And you might notice that around this lantern loop, you find another four loops around it, and this is for the one provided gear loft. So this provided gear loft comes with these hooks that you can use to hang it up, and it fits real nice and snug at the top of the tent. The gear loft is a little bit bigger than each pocket, coming in at about 21 by 12 inches. And I really like that there's quite a bit of space to fit gear in the loft, and even enough space to fit a lantern on the top loop at the same time. Apart from all these storage options, there aren't any others, and there's also no e-port or power port as well. Now for seam taping, this is something I normally go through only in the quality test, but I think it's important for me to go through this first before the rain test in just a bit. The only seams that were taped for this tent were the seams on the rainfly, as well as the seams running the length of the flooring and the corner seams on the flooring as well. The rest of the seams have not been taped, and I think that's because of the rainfly length. It's almost a full length of rainfly, except for the tiny gap at the bottom of the rainfly. 
So, because the rain flag covers practically all of the tent body, most of the seams didn't need to be taped. That's what I think. But before we get into the actual ring test, here's the last of the important waterproofing features, the tub floors. Notice a slight difference between the buffed up height at the length and at the width of this tent. The lengths of this tent have a buffed up flooring of up to about 6.5 inches. On the other hand, the widths have a buffed up flooring of about 7 inches or so, which is very slightly taller. And also take note of this, here's one of the buffed up flooring, the tent body seams, and it is not taped. And now for the part that you've been waiting for, the heavy rain test. So this was my heavy rain test. It rained pretty heavily for about 2 hours or so, and it continued to rain lightly for about 4 hours after the heavy rain, so 6 hours in total. In fact, it rained heavily enough that there was quite a bit of flooding in my yard and the entire right side of the tent was sitting in water. And because of this, I found that one of the corner seams was leaking a little bit. Luckily, there wasn't a whole ton of leaking despite hours of flooding, just a few drops of water, and this was the corner that was sitting in like an inch or two of water. The rest of the other three corner seams, despite being exposed to a lot of water as well, didn't leak at all, which is great. See this corner here? There was light flooding around this corner, but it didn't leak at all. So light flooding is okay, but heavier flooding like inches of water, not okay. Also, I found that the pockets were completely wet. They were so wet that they were leaking water into the tent. Why did this happen? Let me lift the ring fly up from the outside and I'll try to explain why. So this is what's under the ring fly. Take a look at the tent body. Notice that the entire buffed up flooring at the widths of the tent are completely wet. You can still see the raindrops on the tub floor. And look at this, notice this seam at the very top of the tub floor. As I mentioned just a few minutes ago, this seam has not been taped. So notice how the water has seeped into this seam. Well, this is the seam that each of the pockets are attached to. So as the water seeped into the seam, it leaked into the pockets and then leaked into the tent. So ideally, this seam should be taped from not just the inside, but the outside as well to prevent water from getting into the tent. As for the rest of the tent, like the flooring, the tent body fabric, the mesh, there was no leaking at all. As for vents, there are two rainfly vents at the very top of this two-person links. They each have this velcro kickstand and I left them open in my heavy rain test. After the rain test was over, the first thing I saw inside the tent is the two puddles of water right in the middle of the tent. Where did this leaking come from? The vents, which I probably shouldn't have left open and I recommend shutting these in the heavy rain. I think the position of the vents can be improved. They should be facing a little more downwards instead, probably even vertically downwards and they would have leaked less. And also one not so good thing about these vents is that they're accessible only from the outside. Here's what they look like from the inside. There's all this mesh covering it and I have no way to get to them from the inside. As for ring fly ventilation, I usually like to be able to pull the ring fly away from the tent body at all sides. So remember the two vestibules of this tent, one at each length? I was able to pull the ring fly about 31 inches away from the tent body because of the vestibules. And for the width of this tent, I was able to attach my own guidelines and guide them out. This gave me a small vent at each width that's about 11 inches away from the tent body. And also, the rain fly doesn't extend all the way down to the ground. There's a small gap at the bottom for some ventilation. So even with the rain fly on the tent for rainy days, you still get all around ventilation. As for hot day ventilation, here's what the two person links looks like with the rain fly off. There's an okay amount of mesh, I guess, but obviously far from the best that I've ever seen. There is still quite a lot of fabric, especially at the lengths of the tent and even at the widths. If I had to guess, I would say that, I don't know, at least 60 to 70% of this tent is made of fabric rather than mesh. Moving on to quality, here's all the materials that are used to make this tent. Flooring is 75D polyester taffeta, the ring fly is 75D polyester, and even though it doesn't say so here, I suspect the tent body is also 75D polyester because here's what it looks like, it doesn't look super thick. 
The poles are 7000 series aluminum poles. The zippers I don't think are branded because I didn't find any engraving on them, but they're number 8 zippers, which is the size of the zippers. I talk about this a little bit more in test number 5 and 6, and the mesh looks like micro mesh. I'm not exactly sure what size micro mesh, but it was able to keep out all the bugs for me. And here are the marketed specs of this tent, you can just pause it here to take a look. I found the stitching in this tent to be okay as well, except for a couple of loose threads. Otherwise, they're nicely double stitched and genuinely good. For portability, this two-person length has a packed size of about 22 by 8 by 7 and a half inches. Here's what it looks like beside a Coleman two-person sundown tent as well as a 32 ounce Nalgene bottle. The carry bag comes with a kinda small strap at the side, and mine weighed exactly 6 pounds for everything, including all the provided stakes and guidelines. For pros, I think the biggest one that everyone thinks of when it comes to this tent is the price. This tent is really inexpensive, I got this two person links for just slightly over 100 bucks, and I got a very decent quality, very functional tent out of it. I also found the setup process to be pretty easy. There are lots of pros on just the setup itself, like this tent having two different grommets in each corner, there being no annoying pole sleeves, and loads more, all the pros of which I went through in the first test of this video. I also really liked the super high peak height of almost 4 feet. I could basically do everything pretty easily inside this tent, even deflating entire mattresses inside the tent itself. The peak height is actually 1 inch taller than marketed, and the base this area dimensions are also pretty accurate, which is really nice. And here's another pro, the base area of this tent is huge. Inside the inner tent itself, I got a base area of 36 and a half square feet, and on top of that, the vestibules are pretty dang huge for plenty of storage space, both coming in with a total of almost 20 square feet of vestibule area alone. Storage options in the inner tent is also pretty good with two pockets, one gear loft, and one lantern loop. I also really loved that I could pull the rain fly away from the tent body at all sides because this means more ventilation and less condensation. Also, I love that this tent has two doors for a decent amount of cross ventilation. Before we get into the cons, if you found this helpful so far, please help me hit that like button. It shows YouTube that I'm not full of crap and that you're liking this video. Thank you so much and I really appreciate it. As for cons, the high peak height of this tent means that it will catch wind a little more easily than tents that are lower in height. So I recommend fully staking and guying out this tent if you expect any wind. I really like that the guy lines are located nearer the top than the bottom to provide more stability, though I did wish that Elf Mountaineering gave slightly longer guy lines though. Right now they're a little bit short. Also, this tent isn't that great in the rain. I think the brand had the right idea of making the tub floor slightly higher at the width of the tent, but it honestly just wasn't high enough. It should have been at least 10 inches or so, much higher so that the water wouldn't get into the seams from all the backsplashing. So if you want to buy this tent and you expect a lot of rain, you're going to have to do a fair amount of seam sealing prep to the corner seams and the pocket seams before actually using this tent. If you missed it, here's all the rain testing that I did on this two person length that I recommend you watch before buying this tent. And also, despite the high peak height, this Lynx tent doesn't have the most livable space inside. Some of my other better quality budget tents have a three pole structure which gives it more vertical walls, while the Alps has only a two pole structure and much less vertical walls. And the next few points aren't really cons, but I recommend you take note of them. Because of how little mesh there is on this tent, it's more of a 3 plus season tent for your shoulder season camping to keep the heat inside the tent rather than a 3 season tent you use in summer. It is possible to use this tent in summer, but just be prepared. It can get a little bit hot and stuffy, at least that was my experience because this tent doesn't have a ton of ventilation. Also, I'm not sure why this is called a backpacking tent. I think it's a little bit heavy for that. I mean, it weighs 6 pounds for everything, and this is my two-person Coleman Sundome tent, which weighs 6.4 pounds and is just very slightly heavier. Honestly, I think the Alps Mountaineering Lynx seems a little more suitable for car camping rather than backpacking and lucky for me because that's what I use it for. If you need a budget tent to use in hot summers, this Lynx tent wouldn't be the best pick and I recommend that you watch this video instead because there's a much better pick for you in there. I'll put it up when it's ready so do check it out. Thank you for watching this review, you're awesome and I'll see you in the next one.